Hey students, so let's review some things. Remember that inside the computer, everything are ones and zeros, okay? And these are called binary digits. We've discussed this before. And if we take out this part of the word, we end up with the word bit. Now, when we're talking about how many of these little ones and zeros can go through a microprocessor, first of all, for a long, long time, we had 32-bit um, what's called word size. Now, we're going to talk about these in our project like they are pizzas. So you could think of 32 bits of pizza, and that's all that's going to fit in your oven or your processor. Here, now, we've recently upgraded to 64 bits um, in our processors or in our oven, so this is larger. Now, you have to remember, if you've got a 32-bit processor, it can't handle 64-bit software programs or a 64-bit operating system. It's pretty much stuck with 32-bit word size or 32-bit pizzas um, going through the processor oven that we're going to talk about. So when you start hearing about your processor bits changing, that's actually very, very important because right now, for example, when I'm recording this in um, 2014, I wouldn't want to be buying a 32-bit processor because you're really going to be limiting yourself because so many programs are starting to be 64-bit. So let's kind of look at microprocessors and how, how we're discussing it in today's lesson. Um, so if you've seen those conveyor belts like we have at the Pizza Hut or other places that have kind of the conveyor line of pizza, um, the oven right here, this is going to be your microprocessor, okay? And we have here, we have pizza, okay? Now this pizza, this is our word size that we already discussed, okay? And right now we're going to talk about 32-bit, 32-bit um, size here. Let's get that three there. Okay, now this conveyor belt is moving at a certain speed, and we usually hear that nowadays in gigahertz. That's how fast that little oven is just moving on along there, or how fast that processor is processing. Now, in this situation, this is called what we call serial processing because it has to finish this pizza or this word, this 32 bits of data, before it can start the next one. Okay, so this is moving at a certain speed, but it cannot start cooking this next pizza, or the processor cannot start processing this next word until it has finished the one right here in the oven. So it has to finish that. Now, there's another kind of processing that's kind of more like a water pipe, okay? And let's draw this one. So we've got our processor, which is our pizza oven. We just got one conveyor belt for now. And let me change the color of our pizza so we can kind of see that. So now, kind of like a pipeline pushes water through, now these words or pizzas, that it can actually push it through and it doesn't have to finish one before it finishes the other. So you could see that pipelining um, would be more efficient, most likely. I mean, remember how fast this processor is moving or how fast this conveyor belt is moving is very important too. You might have one that's serial processing and that conveyor belt is moving a lot faster. So just realize that you know how fast this is moving is very important too. And there are other factors, but we're just talking processor here. So then we get into something very interesting called parallel processing. Now for right now, we're just going to keep one engine, one pizza oven, okay? But we're gonna talk about something called hyper-threading. Now, for if any engineers ever watch this, they're going to kind of say I'm way oversimplifying, but I just want you to understand the basics of how this works. Um, so here, I can basically, and pretend like these are all 32-bit size here for now, Okay, so now there's actually a way that we can parallel or we can process multiple things at the same time. And there are ways that engineers do this, even with just one processor. 
So here we're using something called hyperthreading, which basically kind of lets one processor process more than one thing at a time. And it's a design thing that they do. So it's parallel. So you've got two parallel lines. You could even have more potentially. Um, this is two threads. You could have more potentially. Now, where it gets really interesting is when you start having uh, multiple cores, okay? And let me scroll up here a little bit and make sure I'm up to the top of this here. Okay. Okay, so let me draw some. So let me just, I'm going to mark, let me move quad core. There we go. So I'm going to draw, let's say dual core is when I have two. Okay, I've got to turn on my drawing here. When I have two processors going here. Now I'm just going to keep it simple again. But now I have two ovens that are running. Okay? And it, this could be serial. It could be doing any different kind of thing. They're going to be doing the same thing, though, because that's just how they work. Okay? So whatever this one's doing, this other one's going to be doing because that's, they're pretty much going to be kind of twins. So they're going to be just alike. Okay? So this would be like a dual core. Now, if it's, of course, if it's pipelining, it's going to look more like this instead of serial. And then quad core, yes, you guessed it. It's going to be four of these, and it's going to be um, four cores here and you can have it set up multiple ways. And remember, we've got all these different pieces. You've got word size. That means the pizza could be bigger or smaller. And the higher, usually the better, especially for not being obsolete. And we've got the number of microprocessors we have here, because this is called cores. These are all cores, or we're calling them oven. And you've got how it processes these words or the pizza, and we've got cereal, okay, oh, we've got pipelining. Now remember, we talked about hyperthreading, so we could actually say have four threads going through this quad core, and you'll be modeling that when you do your um, models of this. You'll be modeling that here as well when you, when you model it yourself to show how you understand these different pieces. So here's the trick, though. It gets pretty complex and pretty hard to understand which of these are going to be, um, which of these are going to be um, working properly. So the thing you have to remember is that a lot of times you have to use something called benchmarking. Now I don't know if you remember when you were a little kid, you were a little short little kid here and your family had a door frame and maybe your mom just said, okay, Johnny is this tall. And then when you grew up and you got a little taller, then they made a new benchmark or a new mark and it grew there and then when you got taller then then you moved higher so how do you measure it they do things like um, the test using something called quake um, i like to use pc magazine to kind of see which one's the fastest and they'll actually test the processors to see because there's something else you have to remember um, there's more than just the processor here some computers um, say let's just use the pizza example say i just had one little guy here having to unload all these pizzas um it might not be as fast so there's architecture or things over here that determine how much how fast this pizza or this data flows back into the computer that can make a difference and it's real hard to get at that unless you test it um, to see, you know, which one is performing the best. So there are theories of which should be faster. Um, and you can kind of eyeball things sometimes. Um, you know, if I had a quad core uh, running at 3 gigahertz, um, and I could probably know that it's in its 64-bit, I could probably know that that's going to be faster than a single core uh, 1 gigahertz 32-bit. I mean, you could pretty much know that, but a lot of times you can't, and you need to benchmark. So I hope this helps. We'll be reviewing some in class as we talk about it, and then you'll be modeling it with our Play-Doh processor project.